What's good everyone, today I'm doing something a little bit different. So I really love Shin Megami Tensei by the Japanese development company Atlas. Like I love it a whole lot and I'm also really interested in religion, religious movements, cults, esotericism, mysticism, all that. So I'm combining my enthusiasm for all these things in this video where we're going to explore the occult history of talking oracular heads and how these creepy devices were precursors to the very thing which sparked the Shin Megami Tensei franchise, which is the idea of demons or spirits being inside of computers, digital demons, if you will. I'm also going to demonstrate that throughout history, up to the present day with the Shin Megami Tensei series, these oracular heads, spirit automata, and even digital devils are more often than not harbingers of evil, chaos, and bad fortune, which means a good time to be had for everyone, right? So without further ado, let's take a look at SMT and the occult, digital demons, brazen heads, and teraphim. Oh yeah, one more thing, I decided to play Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne for this video because it's one of the spookier titles and also because it's one of my favorites. Enjoy! So as I kinda explained, SMT or Shin Megami Tensei is a franchise by Atlas, mostly known for their video game series, the first of which was released all the way back in 1987 for the Nintendo Famicom in Japan, titled Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei or Digital Devil Story Reincarnation of the Goddess. Shin Megami Tensei, the title by which the franchise is best known, was released for the Super Famicom in 1992. These are all, for the most part, monster collecting RPG games where you recruit demons into your main party to assist you in your quests. Under the Shin Megami Tensei umbrella we have the massively popular Persona spin-off series, the Digital Devil Saga spin-off series, and even more which I don't really have time to get into in this video. The franchise now has dozens of games across multiple video game consoles and also entertainment genres including manga, anime, etc. The video games in Shin Megami Tensei are my favorite JRPGs, Japanese Japanese RPGs. They feature heavy philosophical, religious, and existential plot lines with multiple paths throughout the games and with multiple endings depending on the choices you make during the gameplay. However, the franchise didn't begin as a video game, as you may or may not know. It began as a novel by Nishitani Aya called Megami Tensei Digital Devil Story published in 1986. In the novel, a boy named Akemi Nakajima is a high school student in 1980s Japan who is bullied mercilessly by a couple of his classmates. As revenge, he codes a computer program which is capable of summoning a demon, then proceeds to do just that on the school's network computer. At first, the demon simply puts its image and some text on the screen before speaking and before long is able to use the computer as a gateway into our real. Well, suffice to say this doesn't work out too well for anybody no matter how you look at it well I mean I always try to be optimistic but you know it's difficult here because the demon kills a few more of the students than Nakajima anticipated and then it breaks out entirely which sets off a hellish nightmarish chain of events that we'd otherwise want to avoid were we not enjoying it so much as spectators in the story but one thing has struck me about this story it's not unique in fact it's not even the exception it's a great story, but the root of this concept stretches further back than literacy itself. As I'm about to show you, demons, spirits, or other occult entities have always been utilized, quote-unquote, in humanity's mechanisms throughout history, starting with the cultic practice of talking heads. So where might the historical origins lie in the idea of spirits being used as a technological bridge to animate something which before was not animate in terms of religion? Well, let's take a quick journey to the Middle East real quick in a place called Jericho, one of the single oldest cities in the known world. Teraphim can be interpreted in a number of ways because their use has varied throughout history. However, at least at some point, teraphim were clay faces. Sometimes human skulls covered in clay used as clay vessels for spirits to speak as oracles and otherworldly advisors. From the years 1952 to 1958, Kathleen Kenyon excavated the ancient biblical site of Jericho, some of the layer strata dating back as far as 7000 BC, with some estimates dating 
dating it back one or two thousand years earlier than that. In these excavations, Kathleen Kenyon unearthed clay faces, some of which were human skulls covered by a dense layer of clay, which had inscribed gold placed under the tongue of this mask, implying that the creators had imbued it with some sort of incantation to summon some sort of spirit into it, with the focus being on the tongue, an obvious allusion to the divination of speech through these masks. This concept is further illustrated in a paper I found on academia.com by Dr. Emanuela Greipo, a research fellow at the Center for the Study of Jewish-Christian Relations at Cambridge. Dr. Greipo, sorry if I'm like saying that wrong, but she notes a work in rabbinical literature, Herc de Rabbi Eleazar, and I quote, everyone who follows the knowledge of making teraphim will ultimately go down to Gehenna." And just a little note there, Gehenna being also known as Gehenna, a barren place where child sacrifice once took place, which later became associated with a place of torment for the wicked. So we're dealing with black magic, according to this. But anyways, sorry. And uh, the quote continues, They pinch off his head and salt it with salt and spices, and write upon a golden plate the name of an unclean spirit, and place it under his tongue, and they put it on the wall, and they kindle flames before it, and bow down to it, and it speaks to them. Whence do we know what the teraphim speak? For the teraphim have spoken vanity. Now that's ghoulish. Now we can think of these teraphim as a sort of precursor to automatons, almost what we wanted or yearned to be able to accomplish as a species, a thing which talks, which is not human, but an intermediate vessel housing a spirit which you could converse with. So like if you have a teraphim on your wall and company's over for dinner, you really don't have to work nearly as hard at entertaining them. And if you have an especially chatty teraphim, I bet you could even sneak off to the TV room for a round or two of dark stalkers and nobody would be none the wiser. Perhaps the practice of making teraphim out of human skulls is long, long out of practice and maligned since early times. But as humans, we never stopped our pursuit much later in history, the 1500s to be exact, the practice of making the skull type of teraphim being long out of practice, the talking heads turn up again in a work uh, of a play by one Robert Greene from the Elizabethan era. It's pretty spooky, if you'll allow me to tell it at ya, please do get comfortable. This play, titled Friar Bacon and Friar Bengay, wherein the titular friars construct a brass head or a brazen head, a complex mechanical head which they toiled at creating for years. This brazen head they knew could build a brass wall around England to protect its borders from what Robert Greene says, I quote, marauding Danes and other riffraff. And, uh, unquote, I, uh, have nothing against Danes, so, uh, chill. However, their construction lacked consciousness, could move, but it lacked a soul. And to solve this, the two friars did what any God-fearing, pious Christian men would do. They went out to the woods, performed some weird twisted rites, and summoned a demon. They tormented the demon, interrogating it as to how they could have their brass wall to protect England, and how to give their automaton consciousness. Eventually, they were granted their wayward soul to draw down into their automaton. Friar Bacon and Friar Bengay retired to their quarters, exhausted from the rituals they had carried out to animate their machine. They needed rest, however. They didn't want to miss anything important were their machine to speak while they slept. To avoid this, they employed their undergraduate servant, Miles, to monitor the brazen head while they slept, meticulously instructing him to wake them should the machine say anything. While they slept, the brazen head spoke. Time is. Upon hearing these two words, Miles shrugged it off as a glitch, non sequitur spoken in the growing pains of becoming conscious. A while later, the brazen head said, Time was. Again, Miles shrugged this off again as unimportant until the brazen head spoke once more with urgency. Time, Time has passed. passed. In the morning, Friar Bacon and Friar Bengay were distressed to learn that the machine had spoken, but they'd failed to act in time to protect England with their brazen wall. Nice going, Miles. Throughout time, this narrative pops up again and again. Talos in Greek myth was perhaps one of the earliest examples, 
and he is coincidentally a giant statue who is made out of brass, just like the brazen head of Friar Bacon and Friar Benge. In Metropolis, the 1927 silent era film masterpiece by Fritz Lang, a scientist conducts a weird ritual under a pentagram, summoning a conscious entity into his soulless automata. Which brings us back to 1987 with Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei. Nishitani Aya, the author of Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, once related in an interview that he had coded numerous black magic programs which incorporated the cycles of the moon and astrological events, in effect simulating different circumstances and running rituals or ceremonies within them, I guess. Nishitani Aya, on page 24 of Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, states the following, which some up humanity's obsession with black magic, black magic specifically to bring life to our mechanical creations, now augmented with the advent of the computer age. This is my translation from the Japanese, quote, the thing about magic and computers is that there is a strange semblance between them, unquote. As in they're inseparable, they work analogously. Damn. So in a way, he's really emphasizing the point I'm trying to make with this video. And that's that the esoteric, religious, and occult nature, which developed hand in hand with technology, culminating in the advent of artificial intelligence. Thanks for watching. Can you think of any other teraphim or brazen head examples in history? Also, hit that like button if you found this video interesting. And uh, by hitting that subscribe button, you can ensure you help me bring more awesome content at ya on the regular. Of course, uh, in the video description, there is a bibliography of all the articles and whatnot from where I got my information. So uh, if you need to peep that. I'm Dizzy One, and you guys, you guys are the best. Later.